these are my 10 rules of banking 5.0 and perhaps it's going to take three to five years. But the hybrid structure that we're going to be looking at are going to be the tech giants. We mentioned Apple and, and Amazon. Uh, the unicorns are people like Ant Financials and so on, the new fintechs, which is the, uh, the theme of today. And finally, there will be some banks. Now, what people are saying, are we going to you know, eat up this pie? And my answer is not really. Today, the world economy is $90 trillion GDP. It actually will double in 20 to 25 years because that's the cycle. So we're now looking at $180 trillion pie. This pie just gets bigger and then gets divided up. So abundance is out there and everything is to play for. So these are just some of the opening remarks that I wanted to, 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 to work on. And now, basically, handing over to you, Rajiv, with these, some of these thoughts uh, in, in the background. Uh, <laughs> I knew I'd thrown a few little grenades in the air. But uh, over to you, sir, with your wisdom and uh, your holistic and helicopter view of all of this. Thank you. <clears throat> thanks, Tarek. It's a pleasure to be here today. And, uh, and thanks for the wonderful introduction. I, I knew I would uh, probably get to hear that, knowing you. And uh, it's a pleasure to, you know, uh, I can't see everyone, but welcome to everyone. And uh, uh, I'm really looking forward to this discussion, to be honest, especially the way you set the tone, because I'm going to take a radically different route to this. And the reason I will is because uh, I, I believe that the moment you start talking about the future of finance, or well, for a minute, let's just move away from finance. Let's talk about the future of anything. People tend to get carried away with some of, uh, um, uh, you know, the buzzwords that consultants and technologists and and all the other people who are incumbents themselves. Let me let me warn you. You know, they're incumbents in their own industries who are trying to make sure that people buy into the buzz. Uh, sometimes end up obfuscating the issue. So the, one, the very same people who are trying to build the change are the ones actually who are confusing the people who make the decisions. And I think it's important to understand that the future of anything, and certainly the future of finance, because I'd like to narrow down to where I am, is being a constant debate. In my 34 years of my career, and even before, there was never a time that the future was not going to be different from the past. I think it's a complete mistake to ever believe that the past is an indicator of the future. We've seen that time and time and again. Um, you know, we talked about the abundance mindset in the beginning, but you know, I'm, I'm a subscriber to the fact that the glass is always twice as big. So whether we're going to be $180 trillion global economy or whether we'd be 270, I'd like to be surprised on that. But I think the issue is not the numbers. The issue is how we will get, get to that. And so there are certain aspects of what you do need to be divided between what I call the what and the how aspects. And this is where it's very, very important to start understanding that we are in a connected economy where the relative role of of different participants changes. So the what will never change. You talk about money, you talk about banking, you, you, you describe the role of a typical bank, you deal with money, you deal with transactions, you're an intermediary, you fulfill a very important objective of making sure that the, the greasing or the lubrication of the economy happens through money because money flow is critical for any kind of commerce. But on the other side, the how changes as the markets evolve. You know, I was delighted to see those 10 factors. I was delighted to see all the other elements that you talked about, because this is really what I've been talking about for the last 20 years, and I term as convergent disruption. The, the, the good thing that we've seen, and in my career, I'm talking about, I started working in the mid 80s as a banker, when we had those old ledger machines where we used to post things ourselves, to the point that we had to suddenly sit back and start automating, which meant staying up late nights and, you know, these clunky systems and data centers that would break down every now and then, and we'd have to read data enter, to, a situation today where we can have something more powerful on our phone. So the, the process of disruption is constant because there's a constant level of railroad that is being built as we grow, as we, as we move ahead. And you're all benefiting. You talked about the Gutenberg movement. You can, you can talk about the, industri you know, the industrial revolution. You talk about electricity. You talk about, you talk about the steam engine. You talk about anything that has happened. Or even if you talk about the mobile phone and then you talk about um, data and connectivity. It's, it's the smartphones and the devices that have given unparalleled uh, power to people. But the important thing is to stay, you know, to, 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 to be slightly careful and step back a minute. Uh, these are enablers. The things that never change when you talk about thinking 10X is about creating a vision for yourself. And, you know, I'm coming to you after working across the world as a banker in, you know, in different parts of the world, and then also having created banking institutions in different parts of the world. And as I now sit on boards and I run my own uh, investments and, you know, create my own startup entities, I, I realize that there is an element to doing the what, and there's a benefit to figuring out on the how. And then, of course, once you have a vision, it's very important to get the culture in. 
and the culture is often which is ignored and people start focusing on the third piece much before they focus on the second which is really on identi start identifying pillars so to me whether it's it's, it's data it's analytics it's uh, and i'm a big fan of all that don't get me wrong or whether it is artificial intelligence or all the tools and techniques that we talk about these are enablers but i think the important thing for whoever wins whether the incumbents or the insurgents, it is going to be on whoever wins is going to be one that comes out to the unique value proposition that clicks with the end customer. And I think we need to start thinking. There are too many people today who become easy entrepreneurs. They don't have the vision clear. They sometimes don't even understand the purpose while they're doing it. The purpose can't be that I want to be a founder. Worse still, if you've lost a job and you start becoming a founder, it's even crazier. So, you know, I'm talking about, the, you, you asked me to talk about the battles between the incumbents and the insurgents. Frankly, I don't care who wins. I just wish that the better player wins because we as a world benefit, depending on whoever comes on board. What really matters is, as long as we generate value, there will be acceptance. What matters is that the battle between incumbents and insurgents really keeps people razor sharp. It leads to constant reinvention. Either the incumbent will reinvent, or if you, if you represent the insurgents, you will go out there and annihilate them. And, and, and that is the important part that I'm, I would like to focus on and how we do it. So whichever side our audience is on today, whether they are fintechs and the insurgents or the so-called incumbents, it doesn't matter. I think there's hope for all. And I believe the glass is twice as big. The glass is not half as full. And if we work with the abundance mindset that you talked about, then and change the attitude and the focus and essentially change mindsets. And you know, one of my favorite books is Mindset. It's lying on my table as I speak to you. It's all about mindset and grit. It isn't about passion. Everyone talks about passion. Everyone talks about doing things but without really knowing what. And the worst thing is, it's important to also go out and create a diversity of opinion. Read a lot. Read radically different rule, uh, 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 goals and then sit back and decide what your own opinion is. Each of the players that you mentioned, whether it's Apple, whether it's Google, whether it's Alibaba or Ant Financial or any of the other big giants of today or even some of the future uh, insurgents that are coming up, are big because they define this pretty well. Today, a lot of it talks, you know, is talked about as overnight success, but there isn't anything called overnight success as far as I'm concerned. So coming back to the topic, I think this is the yin and yang of innovation that you're talking about, incumbencies versus insurgents. The incumbents and insurgents is the yin and yang of the pull and the push, the healthy friction that leads to constant reinvention of ideas. But before we start looking at the future of finance, and I'd like to move away from technology, artificial intelligence, and all the buzzwords that we talk about, because they sometimes obfuscate them. If you're really talking to bankers, or you're talking about people who want to sit back and focus on finance, then the essential thing that you have to understand is where the world is going. What is happening in the world today that will affect the financial services business? And that's very, very important to understand. And there are six, seven, eight things which are very critical. And I'm going to group them to be able to understand it. One, of course, stimulus is here to stay. Like it or not, uh, central banks all over the world and governments have laced so much liquidity in the world that we are sitting on unparalleled amounts of liquidity, which is very hard to unwind. We've seen that in 2018 when uh, the Fed chief tried to delever it, or we've seen that even in 2013 when uh, uh, um, Chairman Bernanke tried to do the same thing. It's almost impossible to do so. And this time around, again, when we faced the pandemic, the solution was, of course, uh, stimulus and steroids. So clearly, we're going to face a very long extended period of low interest rates. And so we need to be aware of that as a bank, because that has serious implications in banks and to debt levels in the world. The oil equation has changed. And so the originator of capital, the originator of equipment, the, 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 the transfer of uh, resource pools and how capital will now be formed and where capital will be moved to will change. And some of the newer stuff that comes even in that kind of hydrocarbon industry, whether it's around renewables or it's around um, uh, the traditional um, uh, biofuels, uh, there's a healthy tension. And so that does impact money. It does impact banking because there's a lot of money involved out there. And then again, look at the customer end of the business. People are aging. Cities are getting congested. Now this has a major implication when it comes to commerce flow, goods flow, as well as money flow, and hence financial services need to, need to change. So it is no surprise today that while you have some of the capabilities around devices, internet, bandwidth, et cetera, why is e-commerce flourishing? Why is online education flourishing? Why are deliveries happening at home? And soon, why will we have healthcare in everyone? You know, you mentioned Apple going into healthcare. We have a live case in China with Ping An, which started as an insurance company and moved into smart, smart cities, financial services, and now even talking about healthcare. 
So they become a very large uh, participant in healthcare. So it's a natural extension. And what we're talking about is platformication, where platforms are being formed and a banking relationship is often becoming the single point entry into getting the set of benefits by creating networks. And then of course, there's been a significant points number five and six that I want to talk about in terms of future change is mobility has suddenly become real. So no longer do you have to innovate by sitting in, uh, in Silicon Valley and you know, heading out to one end of the world and hoping that you can uh, you know, only innovate in that environment. Today, you could sit anywhere. You could be in Fiji, partner with a guy in South India, deal with a guy in Karachi and another person in uh, Istanbul. And these four people can get together and form an enterprise that serves clients in the US. So you don't need to relocate. You don't need to think differently. You can actually mirror time zones. You have equipment, you have data, you have enablers. But what are we talking about? We're all talking about enablers. What we really need is those four knowledgeable minds who actually tango together, have a vision which is big enough, have a value proposition that they understand and a purpose and a desire to go out and create and disrupt the status quo. So these are, these are elements which are highly critical to, to evolve. And then, of course, customers are far more discerning. Internet, media, et cetera, travel has made things far easier. Technology devices are easier to achieve. I want to, tell you to somehow demystify the future of finance by taking away the common focus that very often people have around buzzwords like disruption, dematerialization, uh, uh, digitization, direct mobility, do-it-yourself techniques, because these sometimes obfuscate the issue to an extent that we start believing that these are larger than life. What is more important to understand if you're talking in the finance perspective is to understand what really is happening in the world. Today, we have more capacity than the demand that is there in the world for products and goods. Now, obviously that's putting a lot of creative tension and a lot of friction into banking businesses. There are a large number of banks that have been created over time by regulators and governments to be able to go out and service an expanding population around the world. But that solution is not really working because banks have become very subscale. There's deflation because so much money has been printed, interest rates are dropping, demand is falling, debt is rising, and there's a, there's a divergent view on even the need to include uh, uh, newer segments into the mainstream and drive financial inclusion, or most banks just do it because it's a regulatory insistence. There's a need for speed, there's a need for discerning uh, elements, and then there are dynamic regulations where banks are uh, often forced to follow rules which are driven by the local governments, the local central banks and, and, and other participants in the economy. So here you're talking about isolated situations where your banks are being managed by central banks who are controlling banks and are driving certain priorities the way they need it. But on the other side, banks are borderless because money market movements or changes of goods across economies and borders are going to affect the, the flow of money. So keep this in mind as we look at the future of finance. Because without understanding what finance is, it's going to be very hard. And the need for finances, if you start worrying about the tools too often, we may miss the uh, woods for the trees. There are certain other forces that are, you, you obviously mentioned a, you know, a few very exciting, intelligent, and I would say the right uh, elements. Let me actually, I was expecting that to be honest, Tariq. So I, I decided to take the reverse view here. And I said, let me, let me also share with you certain forces that really impact uh, banking and financial services. I think there's a massive amount of cost commoditization taking place today. And I say that because traditionally banks have always created ex their expense bases and the investment in clunky infrastructure, technology, et cetera, to become the sole providers of everything that their customers need and their desire to do so. They, have, they haven't always succeeded. And in the process, they created these clunky systems and these core banking platforms that were, that were so hardwired and they became um, you know, natural, um, uh, I would say entry barriers to anybody being able to come in. New banks couldn't come in, it was expensive, it was very difficult to change systems. You talked about and financial refreshing systems every five years. Just imagine changing your core banking every five years. It sometimes takes as much as two years, three years to even implement a core banking solution. So uh, it's important to make sure that what was started off as an investment to create a point of differentiation and a competitive advantage has actually become something that's impeding innovation today and it needs to be dismantled. On the other side, experience ownership. More and more, it's the person or the entity that controls the customer, which is taking a, a much larger share of the customer revenue. And that realization has led to a belief that the value change is completely getting disproportionately shifted. And banks are not even generating what I would say economic capital. So if you, you know, there's a, there's a McKinsey report which says that in the last few years, 
banks have actually, I think the report is a couple of years, data a couple of years, have lost as much as 800 billion and insurance companies $300 billion of revenue uh, in terms of economic capital, uh, economic earnings. So if the cost of doing business against risk-free rates, which is tr traditionally uh, what economic uh, returns are, uh, is, 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 is not going to be sufficiently covered with the kind of earnings that a bank provides. And of course, with the built-in volatilities and risks, et cetera, then actually shareholders are not being serviced right. And the reason for that is not that banks are not profitable today. Banks were always very profitable, but they were profitable in a different era where it just mattered that you had a bank, you had high interest rates, and things were easy to, uh, to manage. But today, interest rates are low, and it doesn't work for banks. There's a lot more banks, so there's a, there's a lot more competition. And there, now there's a realization that the data that they've had has the potential to be monetized. And fortunately, the industry, the rest of the industry, has kept in pace with this and created the infrastructure to start making sure that this data can now be available. And of course, with this process of convergent disruption with telcos, technology companies, banks, governments, and all participants in the ecosystem, the broader ecosystem, are all contributing to make sure that these things can happen. Another big participant is the systematically important text. You know, we talk, talk about them as big techs today, but, but where did these things emerge from? Just like the emerging markets became competitors for the developed markets, because they were traditionally producers and now today are the consumers in the large high growth markets of the world, the techs have been the same. Over the years, as transactions grew intensive, banks started using technology companies to be able to process the transaction using clunky software techniques. But these intelligent companies, which, were, which have been uh, traditionally uh, nimble, they have, they, have, they, have, they have been unregulated, have over time learned a lot of banks in terms of customer behavior, in terms of product structure, and they've gone ahead and created platforms themselves. And, and the very same vendors, if I may use that word, are today becoming competitors to banks because these systematically important techs have created differentiating technologies, you name some of them, which are today being used through platforms, et cetera, to be able to attack banks. And, and I say this not, because, not as an apology, I say this because banks need to realize this. And, and there's a high time we realize if we can't fight them, we need to join them. And then there's a profit redistribution I talked about. And these fintechs on these nimble techniques which are coming with them, they come in the form of fraud as a, as a service or regulation as a service or compliance as a service or software as a service, you know, you call it what you will, have led to the emergence of today Neurobank. You're right, it is possible today for anyone to start a fintech because the platforms exist. You just mentioned it, you talked about Microsoft, Microsoft Azure and you talked about some of the other platforms. But the point is, these things have happened for a reason. And and banks have to be aware of it. And hence banks and my response, which I will share with you, needs to come uh, uh, and I'll share with you in a minute. But it's also important to realize that banks have over time in their desire to control and not just create a clunky infra infrastructure in terms of technology, they've also included in, inside their banks lots and lots of talent, which is really not core to banking. So if you look at a typical bank and look at the population uh, triangle, 80% of the people are either transactors, they're processing transactions, they're servicing clients, they're sitting out on the front end or they're selling. None of that is core to banking. What is core to banking is structuring, underwriting, asset liability management, making sure your money is safe, making sure that you can handle the risks which are inherent in the balance sheet, risks which are inherent in the products, and being able to make sure that you can constantly manage the transactions in a, in a, in a way that you can maintain uh, the reputation, trust, and the fiduciary responsibility that goes with banks. After all, you and I put, put our money in these banks and we would like to be treated fairly by, with, by them. There is, and, and what has happened is that 70, 80% of these people who have been acquired within banks have really no reason to be there. Now, what, what, what does it lead to? Some of these banks, and my apologies to anyone who was in the audience, because I, you know, there's a difference between working in a bank and being a banker. So just because you work in a bank doesn't become, make you a banker. It just means you're processing for the bank. But these jobs and these roles have really no business to be within banks. And these jobs should lie with the center of excellence of all the entity which has a domain expertise to be able to serve them. And this realization is important. So this entire bundling of a bank to make it into this complex, gigantic animal of this thousand uh, ton gorilla is, is really what's working against uh, banks. Banks need to unbundle themselves. And what are fintechs doing? They're doing exactly that. They're hitting banks at the core by unbundling the bank and, and making sure that they take the meaty bits of the business and take over the customer ownership while they leave the regulation heavy, transaction heavy, process heavy, and compliance heavy transactions to the bank. 
So here is a very funny situation where bank is really the railroad to many of these fintechs and talk about open banking, talk about PSD2, talk about all the gizmos that you, you, know, you may mention. All this requires the railroad of banks. But just imagine these banks are running razor thin on returns but are carrying all the risks. And then most of the banks are also subscale over time and the cost of capital is high, the cost of risk is high and you're sitting in an environment which is laced with liquidity. So you talked about hurling 10 grenades at me, but we are sitting in a, you know, a, 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 in a field of landmines and the banking industry actually functions within that. And all this has a lot more of not just eroding profit margins, but there's a bionic workforce that is developed because machines are now replicating what human beings can do. And as a result, it's not unusual for voluntary uh, retirement schemes and you know, exiting employees and suddenly realizing after 20 years of processing transactions in a bank, you suddenly lose a job. And the reason is you had no business to be in the bank in the first place. Because you should, those skills should have been resident in a specialized entity which is good at processing transactions. Is it good, good at doing something else? And so there is a need to start, I would say, paradising or segregating the middle office and back office functions very differently from the front office functions. From understanding what the judgment intensive, which is the intellectual capital of a bank or of or, or, or doctor or a hospital or retail or hospitality economy or, or an e-commerce entity from the transaction intensive parts of the business, which is the necessary part, but it is not the differentiating part. And finally, managing the regulatory pressures. And the reason I say this is if banks start focusing on what their core services are and start partnering with people, I think a lot of this battle can be met. And as far as banks are concerned, what has never changed and will never change are the five C's of banking. Whether you're structuring, whether you're lending, whether you're handling anything, look at the capacity, look at the character, look at the collateral, look at the covenant, and of course, and the, 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 the capital of, of, of the entity you're dealing with. Now, capital can be financial capital, capital can be intellectual capital, capital can be social capital. And so you're talking about using different, different kinds of data to be able to transact and take risks on people and be able to make that. Uh, decisions for them. So essentially, I feel banks can definitely win or as incumbents or the fintechs would win as insurgents as long as both of them follow a very simple process of understanding customer centricity. Today, customer is the king. And one of the biggest challenges in the world is how do you decode the customer's mind? How do you decode your mind from my mind? Or how do we decode the minds of 400 people to, you know, who are on this uh, on, on this um, talk today, we, all, we are all in a common platform. We're all thinking differently. We're all hearing the same amounts of input. So, you know, the stimulus is the same, but the response is very different. So you're talking about a response to external stimuli and the reactions that you create. And very often reactions are created based on, you know, whether you're, you're biased or you're, you're jealous. And the reason I say this is, we, start have to, we have to start realizing that banking has to be human. And I'm, I'm using your phrase because you, you know, I decided that I'd take some of your phrases and integrate it into what I just said. Because if banking is to be human, it does require the use of artificial intelligence, use of far more data, understanding that customers have a choice and being able to start integrating their solutions without sacrificing some of these elements of 5C, the regulatory requirements, the compliance requirements and the trust that are inbuilt into a bank. So, so how do we make sure that this uh, incumbent versus uh, insurgent uh, solution is uh, met with? First and foremost, we must remember that the incumbents of today were the insurgents of the past. And the insurgents of today will be the incumbents of the future. So everything we say here today is going to be relevant to everyone. And, and you know, nobody remembers number two. Nobody is going to remember a failure. So nobody's going to talk about firms that existed in the past and have not succeeded. I think it's very unfair to do that because there've been some fascinating firms in the past that have, they unfortunately do not exist anymore. And, and people sometimes run them down, which, which I think is unfair because they were insurgents in their own right. They may not have survived, but guess what? They survived enough to be able to create a need and, and, and you know, instill in someone else a desire to do it better. So whether you're talking about the Gutenberg moment or you're talking about, you know, getting people suitably be charged, each of them serve a purpose. So how do we make sure that banks win? Well, I think banks have to unbundle themselves. Banks have to join forces with the very same people who are out to get them. It's not that fintechs are smarter. It's just that fintechs are nimbler. It's not that fintechs uh, can't go wrong. In fact, in my view, a lot more fintechs get created because the entry barriers are low and hence a lot more fail. 
But once a bank is formed, the cost of creating, distributing, and failing is so high, the chances are there are a lot more forces out there to make sure that it succeeds. Because the risk of a bank failing is, is tremendous compared to many fintechs failing. But on the other side, this is the classic yin and yang of uh, innovation. If the cost of creating, distributing, and failing is high, then it's very important to make sure you design your systems right. And that's how banks have been typically built. But if the cost of creating, distributing, and failing is low, then you can go out and experiment and actually fail, recoup your energy, and go back. You showed this exponential curve, which I really like. But I look at many of the fintechs following an S-shaped curve rather than an exponential curve. Any venture you create will grow very rapidly. And I'm not against fintechs because I nurture startups. I've been a founder myself, as you know. I've created many businesses around the world. And I, I actually look at myself as a person who's been more of an entrepreneur than just a banker who worked in banks. I believe in it, but I also believe in how to make things successful by making sure that the S curve, after it starts tapering, or tapering at the asymptote level, starts going upwards and doesn't fall. Because everyone defines the S curve, but doesn't discover, define the outcome after that. A lot more of the startups actually start failing. Some taper off and very few succeed. And I think banks can succeed if they also build the same mindset. So here's what banks should do. A, they cannot wish away new banks. They can't wish away fintechs. I think they must realize that they cannot afford to become utilities. And hence, they must start unbundling themselves and start looking at the front office, back office, and middle office very differently and change their operating models. So essentially, rethink or reimagine customer journeys. Customers today are far more discerning, as I just mentioned. Rethink your organizations, rework the culture, and redefine the operating model. And you know the first three are software elements, but they're really important. And then comes the operating model. And, to, and the operating model is the essential enabler that makes it happen. And how do you do it? Break off the front end functions from the middle office and back office. And why is the front end function important? Because the front end function is really what is high customer impact delivering, high customer value creating, which is what a customer comes to a bank for. You want your money safe, you want your money to earn for you, you want your, money, your, your structures to be done. If you're a business person and you're doing cross-border businesses or if you're doing project financing or you're financing a, um, uh, infrastructure or you're buying and selling, um, whatever you're doing or whether it's individual finance, we, it's important to start realizing that there is a need to look at the customer journeys. And, and hence, start unbundling them Take the high customer value businesses, which is structuring, asset liability management, product manufacture, and everything else, create it in the front end and keep that resident as intellectual capital. Focus on getting the best talent there, making sure that these people are empowered to go out and scan and make decisions, help them understand the vision, not be order takers. Get true giants working in these places. And it's representative of how some of these big tech firms work. They, they, they get the smartest people in, they give them a bunch of capital, they give them resources and an unlimited freedom to go out and innovate. And I think banks need to do the same. Banks have traditionally tried to take orders and build everything in-house. So by the time they're able to successfully build what they're trying to build, it's already outdated. So the front end process has to be one of partnership. I, I think in early 2000, Thomas Friedman wrote this book called The World is Flat. And I can only say the world is flatter and flatter and getting more flat as we go along. So we are in a connected economy. We should not be, and banks have to change their views. In the past, regulators were much against the concept of sharing and being connected uh, or allowing banks to share things. Today, even regulators have changed their mindset. And what is important is that these smart people should be out there scanning what is required and a bank should actually take minimal time in building interfaces with things in a secure fashion rather than trying to create everything themselves. Where they feel they have particular skills to do it themselves, they should do so. Now, when you look at the middle office and the back office, I think that's where banks have real strength because they have the core banking systems, they have the regulatory licenses, they have the ability to manage money, and they have the license of the regulator to be able to accept money. That's the critical railroad on which you must ride. Compliance is very important. You wouldn't keep your bank. You wouldn't drive your car without brakes, would you? So you wouldn't even put your money in a bank which is not unregulated. So banks need to recognize this advantage and be able to make it better and nimbler. The question is, they have tried to do that in the past by buying clunky systems, impeding the innovation by not being able to unbundle them, not being able to partner, and as a result have increased the cost of operation, have slowed down in terms of time to market, and have gradually eroded their earnings, and are hence not even delivering economic capital uh, returns or economic earnings. 
against the economic capital that they put in. What, what happens every time there's a crazy situation, banks have, are, are require some kind of a bailout. Now, this time around, we haven't seen a bank bailout, but that's largely because there have been, they've been strong regulations around the capital, et cetera, that they need to keep. But this time around, banks have been required to come in, step in, in this crisis and provide the transmission and attraction benefits. So banks serve a very important purpose. But once they realize that they can unbundle themselves, they must focus a lot on their regulations, the compliance aspects, the reputation of the trust, because that's really what builds uh, customers to come in. And all this with a strong element of customer centricity. Now, if you look at individual banking, banks have to start creating, uh, I would say, uh, a customer centric approach where they build a, a unified experience between, uh, uh, you know, for, for an individual coming in. Not to talk about boring products that a bank sells. Imagine applying for a loan. It's the most boring thing you have to do. Imagine going out and, you know, pulling out your credit card when you're just out uh, uh, for dinner with your friends. That's the most boring part of the evening, isn't it? So if there is a way by which you can make that process easy and help banks dovetail their services, their products through intelligent solutions into the journey of the bank, a journey of the customer in making his or her life better, things work better. People are looking at what? People want their career to do better, marriages, travel, homes, mortgages, sending children to school. These are important milestones. So if banks and money are required for this, but they shouldn't become barriers. They shouldn't become, um, you know, um, uh, uh, blocks or roadblocks in the process. Similarly for a business. A business really requires finance and would like a banking relationship that becomes a unified process to be able to access a bunch of services beyond finance. Imagine needing to spend five to seven months or one year or two years trying to get money and by the time the opportunity goes on. So you need somebody or you need a bank that starts realizing that people need smart capital. They just don't need money. And hence, banks need to dovetail their services and products and embed them into the user journeys that uh, uh, other service providers provide. And of the nature that these small businesses or big businesses or middle emerging local corporate businesses require. And finally, how do you do that? So when you start unbundling the middle office, it's important to start taking a grid of uh, what is a high customer value impacting transaction or a, or, a, or a function within the bank and what is the level of standardization available. So when it comes to core pure manufacturing processes, banks really need to understand that they need to be hyper-scaled, hyper-processed. They need to make build scale because bigger the banks, bigger the opportunity to create efficiencies around structuring, asset liability management, capital management, liquidity, raising money cheap. And, and, and what does this lead to? There'll be a lot more mergers and acquisitions and consolidation. In the UAE, you're already seeing this, you're seeing this in the region, you're seeing this across the world. And in the past, governments uh, often resorted uh, to creating special vehicles, special finance companies and other institutions that could go out deeper and serve specific purposes to drive inclusion. Today, with fintechs coming in and open banking, that may not be required anymore because the core banking functions can lie resident in massive banks who do the essential elements of what is core to the banking and the front end user journey can be managed by others. On the other side, the high, um, uh, the low customer impact items and the high standardized and the low standardized items, things like compliance, regulations, et cetera, can be done by specialists. And then come the high customer impacting and high standardized entities like sales, account opening, et cetera. I think banks will have to unbundle themselves and create strong captives, create partnerships with specialized business process management companies, acquisition companies, et cetera, and dovetail with the broader ecosystem to go out and start acquiring. And then come the low customer value adding and the high standardized items. Give them to KPOs, BPOs, businesses, no business for them to lie because these functions lying in banks become the load that drag them back. So essentially what I'm talking about is unbundling the bank, creating a bank which has now gotten many pieces to the puzzle. And then of course, creating a platform where the banking relationship starts dealing with third party players, et cetera. And then automate the journey of decision-making and then go out and delight them with data-driven decision-making. Now, I'm talking about embedding finance by abstracting it into the customer journey. I'm talking about intelligent decision-making by which automation comes. And I'm talking about platforms, and I'm also talking about platform uh, leverage. So once you start leveraging it, you need data to be able to push solutions that people get predictive. People today want to get things instantly, right? You talked about instant gratification. And for that, banks should be able to predict behavior. And different people need different things at different times. So whatever floats a customer's boat should be done at that time. And for that, you have to understand the client. And how does it get powered? This gets powered by analytics. 
artificial intelligence, third party elements, and of course a plug and play operation and leads to situations where we start talking about regulation as a service, compliance as a service, microservices element, and end to end solutions coming not anymore by creating clunky systems, but by intermingling and interconnecting smartly and bridging interfaces between different providers of services uh, in the nature that I just talked about. And, and it is not unusual now for Ping An to become what it has or for Apple to go into healthcare or Apple to offer a credit card today uh, with Goldman Sachs or Uber to you know, hit out at the logistics industry. All these things are happening for a reason because all of them have understood that their core products un, uh, lead to a situation where their relationship with the client can become the single gateway to multiple set of services that a client may need. So whoever is able to provide it better will win. And Project. all this, yes. Yeah, no, no, please conclude. So I, I just, I just want to say you will see a lot more consolidation in banking. And I don't think it's unusual to say that, uh, to see that, but I don't think you will see a lot more. I hope I don't see responsible or irresponsible acquisitions where banks end up buying fintechs because then you will kill the very reason why you wanted to buy that because you kill the kind of creativity that is needed. But I do think banks may, may have to shed some of its infrastructure with its ATMs, POS infrastructure, data centers, et cetera, and start using hybrid solutions, which are part of the public financial market infrastructure and start monetizing some of the expenses. I do think there'll be strong partnerships between banks and certain captive players where they want to, where they want to sit back and rewire the organizations and create uh, efficiencies in what they do. Lastly, you did ask me, uh, I talked about regulators. Regulators are far more friendly. Regulators today have realized, especially COVID has been a wake up call. What would have otherwise taken us 10 years has probably happened in three months, if not 17 days. Um, but it has proven that ingenuity of the knowledgeable mind is really what makes a difference. Culture is what makes a difference. Thinking big is what makes a difference. And these things haven't changed in the last hundred years. And I don't think will change in the last, you know, whatever buzzwords we may use, whether we're talking about finance 20.0 or we're talking about 200.0, if these things will never change. So we must start recognizing what the, what the intellectual capital is that an entity, whether it's healthcare, whether it's retail, whether it's e-commerce or banking that, that you, you're known for and what the relational capital that you have by partnering with people and creating that. And it's that element of partnership, it's that element of making sure that you work together which creates one plus one being 11 rather than one plus one being two. Second, and the last point I want to make is about boards. You did say, uh, what about thinking? And I would say, I'm, I'm, I'm delighted to say that boards are becoming increasingly involved with banks and are, they're not paranoid, but they're obsessed with being future ready, which is a good thing. Boards are getting in a huge amount of operational expertise, working very closely with managements. I see a wonderful partnership between boards and management uh, in trying to make sure that you can be future ready, regular stress testing, regular scenario planning, making sure that uh, newer changes are built fast. And I'm talking about companies that are to be successful need such boards and need such board members. They need management, of course, to do things, but there's an important element that even boards have to provide. Be supportive. And it's good to have operational people on these, in these companies who can understand some of these transitions because every board member wants the bank to do well. But the question is, is how do you make a difference? And that difference comes in with the operational expertise that is now being introduced into boards. And then of course, the important issues of even looking at um, flexible work arrangements, working from home. I think that is going to be one of the fundamentally most important changes that is going to happen in the world that will make a huge difference. Huge difference in attitude, huge, huge difference in productivity, uh, even the cost structures, real estate, people, people commuting, et cetera. On the other side, there's an equal challenge of needing to make these people feel closer to organizations. So there's a need for physical proximity. So there will be a hybrid model evolving and there needs to be a far more involvement around that. But there is an, the important thing is that boards are open to it. And at the same time, boards are also very, very mindful of cyber risks and some of the other reputation risks. But the best part, and I, and I have to say this in the end, is that they're very keen to make sure that they are complementary skills. So just like technology companies are now looking at not getting in bankers or banks are now looking at getting technology company, boards are, get, boards are equally mindful of making sure that there are complementary skills that are made a part of the plan. And it, sometimes it's wrong to get them to be proprietary to yourself, in which case boards are also open to partnerships. And, and everything that you said is I think a logical journey which will, which will uh, help people go forward and do things better. I'm not sure whether you can refresh technology every now and then in the bank because you know some of the pressures. You can certainly, if you unbundle that, refresh the relevant pieces to remain uh, 
remain effective and efficient and competitive enough. But I think boards and managements are today focusing a lot on zero-based uh, reimagination, rethinking of organizations, reskilling of organizations and changing culture. So it's not always technology that needs to be changed. I think the biggest thing we need to change is our mindset. The second thing we need is a tremendous amount of grit, not just passion and the courage to resolve it. Third is a lot of integrity, professional. I'm not just talking about personal. And of course, the energy to go out and execute. A lot of people dream and conceptualize. Very few people end up executing. So let's go out and hope that whoever wins is able to walk the talk and be able to do things. And either way, as I mentioned, whichever way this debate goes or whichever way the ticker goes on the vote uh, in this session today, I think the world will win. And the bet let the better player win because at the end, we all benefit. And um, incumbents have a purpose as long as they remain refreshed. And insurgents have a purpose as long as they come out and reinvent. And um, so I remain hopeful. The glass is twice as big. I, I will use that. Uh, the glass is twice as big uh, because it's brilliant. Thank you. Thank you very, very much indeed, Rajiv, for that absolute masterclass. I mean, it's, it's a true masterclass on finance. I have learned so much. I'm going to be watching this thing at least four or five times to learn because uh, I was doing a lot of surface level skating. Uh, today, I got an in-depth uh, piece. So thank you very, very much indeed uh, on that. Uh, a couple of early questions, and then we'll open it up to uh, the audience to ask questions. Uh, the first early question is that in the United States, uh, only 28% of the people actually trust their bank to be fair and honest. 28% only. Shame on them. Congress is 22%, and media is around 25%. So <laughs> between the three of them, shame on all of them. But how can we give our money to people and we don't feel that they are honest or fair? I, I, I can't understand that. And how can they end up producing products and investing in businesses? And 72% of the people are saying, I don't like what you're doing. I think, um, I think that's, a, that's an excellent question. And I, I agree with you. Shame on banks for, for doing that. Shame on all of us as bankers for, 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 for having done that. But I guess it's a combination of factors that has led to it. And it will require not just a shift in how a bank can function, but I, I think it, it stems from a few things. One, it stems from shareholders themselves. Irrespective of what happens, whether it's the GFC, the global financial crisis, or there is one crisis or the other, there's war or pandemic or whatever it is, the desire to get ridiculously high returns in the, in the, in, you know, the 16 to 20% range has never gone away. So there's been no right setting. So here you talk about management uh, uh, of banks who are under pressure to sit back and deliver. Secondly, the, the global financial crisis has left a, a bad taste in the minds of people because it is true that when the, when, when, um, uh, the problems happened in 2008, uh, banks had to be bailed out. But if you sit back and look, where, did, where was the error lying? The error was not lying only within banks. Yes, they were, they, the error lay in the fact that there were incentives given to management to deliver returns in an environment which were increasingly dangerous. But on the other side, there was an equal responsibility. There's a shared responsibility here on the part of regulators. Uh, for very different reasons of building the macro economy, interest rates were dropped to ridiculously low levels and, and banks were allowed to drop their capital levels and build huge balance sheets to be able to help the broader economy. So the crisis had to happen. Which, which actually ends up, uh, what was my next question, was about uh, to regulate or not to regulate, uh, and, and, and especially in terms of uh, uh, the, the challenger institutions coming in. Uh, in, in China and other places in the emerging world, uh, the regulator has been fairly lenient, uh, and so these a lot of these people could have uh, leapfrogged. So, what are the kind of quick response on what are the kinds of things the regulators could do? Create sandboxes, create testing environments, uh, you know, and 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 a lot of uh, uh, learning and development with the technologists and and, and other people. Uh, what are your thoughts in terms of how should we develop the regulator to become funky and future ready? I guess the first thing I must say is you must regulate. I, you know, when you're talking about the banking business or you're talking about the healthcare business or the aviation business, I would be very scared if you don't have a common standard and you don't have oversight. But what it does require is a smart regulator. What it requires is the regulators also to look at regulation in a constant stage of looking at the future differently from the past, recognizing the realities today. Uh, I would, I, I, I don't like the terms under-regulating or over-regulating because I think it's right regulation at any point of time. 
But a very important aspect is if you hire right within banks and you incentivize right, then you self-regulate. And, and this is where I talk about the, the, the professional uh, integrity aspects. Hire the right people. Hire people who have the ability to push back against boards. Hire people who have the ability to, even within boards, to be able to challenge shareholders and to be able to challenge managements. Have the humility to be able to create partnerships. So if there is a reasonable check and control and check and balance in what you do, then things go right. Going light on regulation to allow certain entities to do well becomes very difficult to contain in the future because you're setting yourself up for failure. Today, some of these new ventures, which are relatively lighter on regulation, are, are able to get away with what they do because the impact of any of them failing is not going to be systemic. Yeah. But, but banks are systemic. Imagine, however big or small a bank may be, if, if it fails, the run on risk and the contagion risk it causes is huge. So regulation is a must. Uh, right regulations are much, the right kind of regulations must, and self-regulation is must. So I think we all have a responsibility. And for that, you have to hire right, train right, incentivize right, and build the right culture. You already answered my next question, which is mindset over tool sets. Uh, so uh, you want to reiterate that? My favorite book. You should read it. It's <laughs> okay. a book, so that was my next by... question. Um, <laughs> You know, I, 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 I agree with mindsets. You have to be able to create an owner mindset. And when you create an owner's mindset, or better still, a parent's mindset, there are very few children, very few parents who will ever want the children to be hurt. I, I think non-existent. Every parent wants the child to do better than themselves. Now, these are some natural elements. So build a parent's mindset, a founder's mindset, an owner's mindset, then you always want the institution to do better than yourself. You're willing to sacrifice yourself rather than go out and have the institution not do well. And yes, demystifying. What are the top two or three? Yes, what are the two or three common myths that we need to uh, completely throw out? Well, I think the the first and most important myth is do not get caught up with these buzzwords. Do not get caught up with uh, the terminology that consultants uh, and lobbyists, etc., are using because they obfuscate the issue. I think it's it, none of the future of finance or none of the future of healthcare has anything to do with blockchain or fintech. Or, or, you know, or, or artificial intelligence, et cetera. These are enablers. I think what is very important and to, to realize is that you cannot have a one size fits all strategy. It's very important to realize what your purpose is. Another thing to, uh, uh, another myth that I would like to demystify, it's not actually a myth, it's a, it's, a, it's a well understood fact, but often in practical life, it gets ignored. When you look at a market, it's important when you do a business, it's important to look at the level of innovation, the level of resources, the market, the credibility, the capacity that exists, and realize that oftentimes in whichever industry you're in, there is only room for two or three players at the top. So if there is already a market which has two or three large scaled, full function, universal solution provider institutions, whether it's a bank or it's financial services or anything else or healthcare, then thereafter there's only room for a lot more nimbler, smaller, highly efficient, highly profitable niche players. So try not to be the fourth or fifth player and be large and scaled. It is not always fashionable to be large and scaled. There's a room in the world. There's a long tail that exists in every normal curve. And, and the world needs a few chiefs and, and many Indians. And I'm not referring to Indians, I'm referring to uh, the American Indians. So it, I think when people sometimes go out and try to do things which are beyond what they can possibly do, or they don't think of the purpose, they don't think of the culture, and they don't think of the necessary enablers and the real market opportunity, they end up falling prey to what vendors sell, consultants sell. Well, I guess a lot of my consultant friends are not gonna be my friends after this. And they end up selling the same story to multiple people. And what do we do? We create far more capacity than the demand that exists for these values. So let's, the, 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 sorry, the last line. The biggest hey. problem is too much debt, too much capacity for as much demand. And you know, we, we keep creating more and more capacity and misaligned actions on the part of regulators. Now you've got to realize misalignment doesn't work and misalignment will always happen. I mean, uh, you talk about too much debt. Uh, we have grown about $30 trillion in the last 20 years. And at the, at the same time, uh, the, the debt has increased by 178 trillion. Uh, so basically it's six times more. Uh, so we're you know, celebrating, congratulating ourselves when actually we've gone out there and taken out cheap debt. So, I mean, that's for another occasion. Uh, but yes. anyway, so just, just wanted to throw a ball in the air. Just a couple of little uh, slides just for you to, uh, to see. We've spoken about boards. 
are they paranoid, frozen? Are you seeing a lot of positive things about the boards? My view is well, that, uh, they're just my, not engaging with the future enough. No, so I was talking about successful boards. I was talking about the boards I'm a part <laughs> of. Otherwise, I wouldn't be a part of them. Yes, they're definitely paranoid. I think paranoia right. is good as long as you do something about it. Are they right. frozen? No, no. And I think boards that are frozen or boards which are not going out and acting uh, yeah. would, not, would lead to institutions that would perish because either they would crowd out their own talent and talent would leave or they yeah. would lead to situations which are adverse. Uh, I don't think regulators, society, community, shareholders, and a bunch of other people are going to allow that to happen. I think there is far too much awareness. So I tend to be more positive. Uh, there may be, I think more and more boards are in this uh, transition phase. Uh, regulators are forcing boards to be able to ensure that there is adequate amount of independence. Independence is not in terms of being a nominee or not being a nominee for a particular person, but independence means having independence of mind, having the ability and the stature to be able to come in and come with a view, introducing diversity of thought, introducing challenge, introducing an ability to get the challenge accepted and then work together to make the institution successful. Board members should not be there because of the ego. Board members should be there to be able to help facilitate the management. Yeah. And I think, I think these attributes are coming in increasingly and, and uh, the importance is being felt by shareholders one and regulators. Uh, one of the initiatives we have is uh, youth advisory boards uh, below the age of 28. Uh, and, uh, and in some cases, uh, we've got below the age of 25. Uh, coming in with a completely new set of questions, new set of thinking and pulling it all together. Uh, so our youth advisory boards, uh, future advisory boards are one of the key things that we love to provide to boards like yourselves uh, and sort of take an alternative perspective, a 25 year old perspective, if they're thinking 50 years ahead, uh, because they're going to live much, much longer. So uh, in the final couple of points, uh, one of them, and then I have a, and this one I want to throw uh, is that is tech and, and strategy consulting because they are killing it right now. I mean, is it, and, and this literally is immediately after the boards, is are the boards just feeling safe? They are covering their butts. They are basically saying, McKinsey is doing this, they are doing that, and, and throw in a, a, a big tech player in there, and, and we are safe and we are fine. Uh, I think- Last question from me, I, and then a couple of questions from the audience, uh, and perhaps the, uh, uh, the uh, other uh, panelists who've just joined us. So yeah, quick- Would you like me ask. to respond to that? I, yes, I think I think I think this has been the older approach. Increasingly, boards are not allowing this to happen. I think there's strong questions asked to getting in a consultant. I think a consultant, if they come in, or a, or, a, or a strategy solution that comes in, is coming in for very different purposes. Either they come in where you want someone to come in and stimulate a discussion, because strategies can never be made by an external party. I, I believe, and after having cre created institutions around the world repeatedly and startup institutions or turning them around. Uh, I, I don't believe uh, consultants can sit back and solve your problem. Yes, they can come in and be, is, help stimulate a thought process, help put, a, put an order around it, but the ownership of the strategy has to be th that of the management. Yeah. So I don't, think, I don't think those solutions are happening. I think covering um, uh, uh, um, you know, the, the posteriors of uh, board members, I, I think that's an old strategy. That is really not happening anymore because board members actually really are passionate. The come on, amount of time that is spent and making sure that a change happens, the amount of, and the kind of uh, board members that are being introduced who dare to say the right things, who dare to sit back and drive change. And at the same time, they also need to understand they're not always right, um, you know, because there's always a time and place for everything. Uh, I think there's a judicious amount of use of consulting. I think technology is definitely an enabler, but yeah. what kind of technology is the solution? Now, is it big tech? Is it going to be fintechs? Is it partnership? Is it building interfaces? Is it buying technology? Is it partnering? And, you know, so I think those kind of questions are being asked. Uh, but certainly, I, I think the era of, uh, it, there may still be many cases, but the era of just sitting on a board for the sake of attending a meeting and not getting involved, uh, I think is a thing of the past. And um, the solutions are no longer uh, solutions that are just to be done for the sake of face saving, but actually to uh, drive change and, and be thank you. Raji, invested just to in the conclude, project. Thank you. Uh, just to conclude, uh, there are th I'll put three or four of the questions that have come from the audience, and I'll throw them out to you together, and you can pick and select that and then do a little wrap-up. Uh, one of okay. your friends, Atulia Sharma uh, from Oman, uh, he's talking about cryptocurrencies and, and DeFi exchanges, the, the disruption will uh, foremost impact the central bank because borderless, cashless, all of these exchanges are coming in. So that was one question from uh, Atulia. Then we've got another couple of questions. 
uh, from Jamil. Uh, his bank employees of large, well-known traditional banks tend to get arrogant and rude and gloat over their position. In a post-COVID world, what specific training and development um, in terms of cultural development upon is missing that requires them to be more customer friendly when employees uh, rise in their position? Uh, another question come, came in, do you think that incumbent banks are starting to make the necessary shifts in their mindset and strategies to position themselves to remain more customer centric than the competition in their battle with the fintechs? And this was from Leonard Lamb. Uh, uh, Maya came back and said, I'd like to push back on the front, middle, back office separation. How would you motivate and build a culture for a back office? Uh, and Maya also said, that, how would you motivate and build a culture for a back office entity, especially if it only serves a single bank? So uh, these are some of the questions uh, that I've, we've highlighted. If you can just uh, uh, you know, yeah, I, give I, a general I, answer I, and a concluding statement. And if our, uh, our panelists want to ask any questions, any final questions, Rajiv, then after he finishes, please go ahead. So I, I'll, I'll try to answer the last question first. I think that's a that's a very good observation. When I'm talking about unbundling the bank, I you know I I, I also talked about the building and, and the essentials of building a culture. Um, I I don't believe that a culture suffers if you do it right. The fact that you outsource your activities or you house them in a separate entity does not necessarily mean you you estrange them from the rest of the bank. I think franchise, you know, disenfranchisement can happen even within the bank if you're in the same entity. And that's based on the nature of how you manage it and the kind of uh, span of control you exercise. So these things are easier to manage. Certainly culture should not be sacrificed. I fully agree. Ownership, customer centricity doesn't go away. There was a question on customer centricity. I, I've been emphasizing that all through, understanding customers, decoding the customer's mind, making sure that solutions are uh, you know, on a horses for courses basis, making sure that you, know, you don't uh, sit and do a one size fits all approach for others. I think I've said a lot around it. I hope um, it, it, it's uh, provided flavor so I won't spend time on it. Cryptocurrencies, I, I think this is a phenomena that's bound to happen. And cryptocurrencies will only develop further. I'm waiting for the time when there is going to be regulation around uh, cryptocurrency and we see crypto fiat currencies. And you know there may be certain countries that are ahead of the curve. And I think China is very close to that situation where most things are getting digitized as far as currencies are concerned. Why is it important? Not just because you, you, know, you can do away with, with mints and the physical cash and storage elements that exist, but I think it's going to give. And you answered the question in a way uh, when you talked about 178 trillion of uh, debt coming in to be able to create growth of 30 trillion. You know, what you're really saying is that for every 100 bucks you put in now as stimulus, you only get about 16 bucks, 16 bucks of growth. Now, so the age old solutions are not going to work anymore. So every time there's a crisis, the level of stimulus you need to put back to be able to restore normalcy will be several times higher. That's because the transmission effects are just getting that much smaller. Yeah. And hence, at some stage, we will need to get into the negative interest rates. And negative interest rates are not possible till we have digital currencies. If, as long as they're neg uh, uh, physical currency, there will be a, a level below which people will not keep money in banks. So for instance, it's, it's, be it's believed that today 75 basis point negative or 100 basis point negative is just about the amount a person is willing to take as a hit. Beyond that, people would build their own vaults and keep physical cash in the vaults. Uh, so I think governments have no choice but to move towards negative currency unless they sit back and do a massive reset. Now, you know, that's, a, that's a, another discussion uh, uh, that we can have at another point of time whether and how it is possible. But currently in the rule book, the only solutions they seem to have is to keep throwing back a lot more liquidity. And in which case digital cur currencies will come, crypto is here for real. I think the need for crypto with regulation and making it a crypto fiat currency is very important. Finally, arrogance. I love that question. You know, the question around, you know, becoming arrogant. There is no place for arrogance in a bank. I, you know, whether you're in the senior management in the front office, the middle office, uh, I'm sorry, I don't remember the name of the gentleman who asked this question. I think it's a wonderful question. We have to have a lot of empathy training at all points of time on the softer skills. And hence, it's, you know, the, this whole desire to become mechanical, it's a bit scary. You know, to drive efficiency and automate things with voice recordings and other things and sometimes realize that the person on the other side cannot understand how to do it. And you, remember, the customers are a whole spectrum of customers. You're dealing with millennials. We talk about youth boards. What about the people who are in the elderly stage? What about people like ourselves? What about people like our parents? They're not going to find it easy to do business either. So, but where do the money pools lie? Money pools lie in the older generation. Where does the future lie? It lies in the younger generation. So you're, this is the constant battle between potential, which is the elder generation, 
uh, sorry, the younger generation and performance, which is getting paid for by the elder generation. So we need to provide for the whole spectrum and the right choices. You called it omni-channel, another buzzword, but I would say we need to provide something for everyone. And that's customer centricity and training and individual belief and, you know, serving people well and caring for them is fundamental. Arrogance has no place. Humility is in, hubris is out. Rajiv, on that happy note, uh, what, a, what a wonderful masterclass. I mean, genuinely uh, so. And I let it run a little bit more than, uh, and I am very uh, sort of kind, all the panelists, the other panelists kindly listen to it. But honestly, uh, I've seen a lot of uh, people talking and we had a lot of wells of wisdom in the last one hour that Rajiv has been with us. Absolutely, absolutely privileged to have you, Rajiv. And we learned a lot and this is going to be there with us for a very, very long time.